people are asking, is the Old Testament still applicable today? To answer that, let us try to look at the meaning of the word Bible. The very simple explanation of the Bible, the word Bible came from two words. It's about two books and it refers to the Old and the New Testaments. So we could say that the Old Testament is the first section of the Bible covering the creation story of God's love and for His people and it also narrating the result of unfaithfulness and faithfulness to God. And we could just say that it's also an expression of God's love by giving instruction to His people. That's in the Old Testament. When we look at the Bible, approximately it is said that 77% Old Testament and 23% is New Testament. Maybe we'll be asking what Jesus said about the Old Testament. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to chapter 5 verse 17 of the book of Matthew. Say, sir, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. It's referring to the writings of the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. And he further said, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. To the question whether the Old Testament is still applicable today, Jesus Christ himself said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the New Testament, when you try to look at the New Testament, it is saturated with the old. That is, the inspired writers of the New Testament quoted the inspired writers of the Old Testament as a source of authority. And you know, among the books often quoted or referred to was the book of Deuteronomy along with Psalms and Isaiah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, John, Romans, Galatians, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and even the book of Hebrews, the pastoral epistles and revelation, many times they all go back as the reference to the book of Deuteronomy. So this week, we'll look at a few of those instances and see what truth or present truth we can draw from them. So I'd like to welcome you to our study. It's looking back of the book of Deuteronomy in the New Testament. First, let us try to look at the temptation of Jesus Christ. During the temptation of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself referred to the Old Testament during in overcoming the temptation of Satan. The first is about turning the stone into bread. Turning the stone into bread. Jesus responded to Satan's temptations in the wilderness by saying in the book of Matthew chapter 4, okay? Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And that is the memory text that we have for this week. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. It says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The background of this, that now when the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. 
Jesus Christ was so hungry and the enemy came to him and tempted him to turn the stone into bread. And the answer, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Where did Jesus take this passage? Ah, it's from the Old Testament. He quoted this, this passage from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Open your Bible in that uh, book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. And it says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And that is from the book of Deuteronomy. Meaning the present truth that we could derive in the saying of Jesus, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And even in the Old Testament, Jesus just quoted it. Meaning that and among those lessons was that man shall not live by bread alone, but lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And a very spiritual lesson for us today. God fed you with physical food, but He also gives you spiritual nourishment. You cannot take only the first without the second. Jesus used this image of bread as a transition of the Deuteronomy and to rebuke Satan, the doubt that he tried to instill in Jesus. That's the first temptation. And again, in the second temptation of Jesus Christ that we could read is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Let us open our Bible, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. It says there, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And you know, Jesus Christ answered that by quoting the Old Testament, especially in the book of Deuteronomy. Where could we find the text? Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Meaning that during the time he just quoted the very word of God during the journey in the wilderness when they tried to doubt the leading of the Lord. Do not tempt the Lord. Meaning do not put the Lord do not put God into test. Meaning do not doubt him. And Exodus 17.7 the one that was quoted by, by Jesus Christ says, The Lord already had shown them over and over His power and willingness to provide to them. Yet the moment trouble came, they cried out, Is the Lord among us or not? They put the Lord into test. They doubted of the deliverance in spite of the great evidences of God's leading. And it was from the story that Jesus, that Jesus drew from the word of God to rebuke Satan. So, during the time of Jesus, especially in the time of temptation, Jesus Christ referred to the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. Not only Jesus Christ, but even Paul, Paul, in his writings, referred to the Old Testament. Again, many times in the book of Deuteronomy. Take, for example, the issue about showing favoritism and partiality. Paul, in his teaching, in his writing, said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6, 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, this is from New King James Version. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God used personal, God used personal favoritism to no man. And for those who seem to be something, I did nothing to me. Where did Paul quote this passage? That God shows no partiality. God is not, uh, this is not practicing favoritism to people. He treated people equally. My friends, Paul quoted that from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Shall we read? It says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. Verse 18, He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. So Paul quoted the book of Deuteronomy. And also Paul talks about the law and grace. Galatians 3.10, which is uh, always quoted by many of our friends, especially of alluding the keeping of the Sabbath as a part of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. The verse says that, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue to do every, reading, everything written in the law, in the book of the law. Where that Paul quoted this verse? Again, my friends, it's from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 27, 26. Curse is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law. And all the people say, Amen. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. So the same in that verse of that we read while ago in 27, verse, uh, chapter 27, verse 26, Curse is the one who does not confirm to the words of the law. And, unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's common in Christianity to use this letter as some kind of justification for not keeping the law. Because curse is those who rely on the law. And it is referring to the Ten Commandments. And of course, that argument is really used as a reason not to keep the Fourth Commandment. When you say, shall we not now keep the Ten Commandments? Because those who rely in the law, curse will be, according to the book of Deuteronomy and also to Paul. And some are telling that because they don't want to keep the fourth commandment, which is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As if keeping the one commandment, as opposed to the, one, the, the other nine, is somehow an expression of legalism that Paul was dealing with here. Yet, Paul was not speaking against the law and even the book of Deuteronomy. And certainly nothing in this passage could justify breaking the Sabbath commandment. Look at again Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. The key can be found in the word rely, where he writes that all who rely on the works of the law are under curse. You notice the word rely. If you rely in the works of the law for your salvation, you are under curse because the law has no power to erase your sin, to erase your transgression. So those who rely, they could not be helped. But in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10, it does not say those who obey. Only those who rely, 
who don't believe during the time of Jesus Christ, his audience was those who believe who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior. And they are so particular of the keeping of the law for their salvation. If you rely, then it's a curse. But it does not mean that we should not obey the law because the law has some other functions, which is very important. It's not to earn salvation, but they have other functions. So Paul's point is that we are not saved by the works of the law, but by Christ's death on our behalf, which is credited to us by faith. His emphasis here is on what Christ has done for us at the cross. Paul, though uses that as a symbol of Christ's substitutionary death on our behalf, Christ became a curse for us. Christ became a curse for us. Instead of for us to be cursed because of the law, because of our sin, but He faced the curse of the law, that His death, which all humans would face because they have violated the law. It is only through Christ that we will be saved. So we rely in our salvation in Jesus Christ, in the grace of Jesus Christ, and by faith, and we take it by faith, and that is what we rely on for our salvation. But the law, does not, it does not mean that we disobey the law. So, Peter, uh, Paul, quoted that in Deuteronomy and also reminded that during the time when he had his ministry, during the time when he was preaching about Jesus Christ. Then it's not only Jesus Christ, it's not only Pete, uh, Peter, it's not only Paul, but also Peter and Stephen quoted Deuteronomy by telling about the prophecy that there is a coming Messiah and that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of that prophecy. You look, my friends, in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Stephen was seeking to show to the people that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. And when he was preaching Jesus, he was accused of blasphemy because people were not convinced that Jesus is now the coming Messiah. We could read the story in Acts chapter 6, verse 11. Contrary to the charge against him, that Stephen had been speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. But Stephen proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah is now the direct fulfillment of what God had promised through Moses, which is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 15. Shall we read? It says, The Lord God will raise for you a prophet like me, from your midst, from your brethren. He shall hear and raise you up for a prophet like that. So, that is what Deuteronomy is saying in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Stephen quoted that. That is now the fulfillment of the prophet, promise of uh, the prophecy of Moses that there come time that the prophet will come. He, is, he serves as a mediator. That's why he was thrown to death because many did not believe. And even Paul also adopted the teaching from the Deuteronomy that the Lord God will judge his people. We should accept the offer of salvation and remain faithful to the Lord. Look at in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, beautiful uh, beautiful verses as a reminder for us that Jesus Christ came to redeem us and we should believe and we should be judged later when you believe it, when you make a decision to reject or believe. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 to, to 31. It says here, for if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, 
but certain fearful expectation of judgment and the indignation which will devour the adversaries. Verse 28, Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy in the testimony of two or three witnesses. Then we come to verse 29, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose when he thought worthy was trampled the Son of God? If during the time of Moses, when they were those who rejected the offer of salvation and sin against God. The sin here is not the, the transgression, although the, the committing of a worse sin, but it is trampling and disrespecting God. And they are judged by stoning. How much more when we have the truth today? And Jesus Christ himself died for us. If we keep on rejecting that beautiful message, then judgment will come to us. You have more light and more truth than the deed. And you know about the sacrifice of the Son of God for your sins? Thus, if you fall away, your condemnation will be greater than theirs. And then Paul immediately goes back to the book of Deuteronomy after writing this. And where could we find that? Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6. Whoever is deserving, is deserving of death shall be put to death in the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death in on the testimony of one witness. The overall message of that in the book of Hebrews and also in the book of Deuteronomy is that in your decision making, rejecting or accepting, the Lord will judge His people. And the heart of Christianity, there remains forever a three. To remove the three is to emasculate the faith. And at the end, no man can evade the fact that in the end, judgment comes. Even though how much you try to justify your transgression and rejection of Jesus Christ, then at the end, judgment will come. Okay, so we have cited some New Testament verses that Jesus quoted, Paul quoted, and Stephen have quoted from the book of Deuteronomy, and even Peter also. So we can, can make a conclusion in the question, is the New Testament still a part of the Bible today. Unfortunately, so many people are telling, oh, our reference is just in the New Testament. Especially to a load from the, the, the Ten Commandments. But friends, it's so clear. Bible. Two books. The Old and the New. You cannot call it Bible when it is only New Testament. So our conclusion is that just as the Old Testament quotes itself, the New Testament is filled with direct quotes, references, and allusion to the Old. Psalms, Isaiah, Deuteronomy were among the most quoted. And one can learn a great deal too about how to interpret the Bible by how the inspired writers of the New Testament used the Old Testament. And one of the first lessons we could learn is that unlike so much Bible scholarship today, the New Testament writers never raise any question about the authority of the Old Testament books. To come up with truth, our reference is not only from the New Testament. Again, I'd like to repeat, to come up with truth of reference is not only from New Testament, but the whole Bible, the Old and the New. Friends, we cannot afford to make a mistake in studying the Bible because at stake is our eternal life or eternal death. When the lawyer make a mistake, then you'll be, you'll be landed back up to prison. 
or when the doctor make a mistake, you may die and you land up to the cemetery. But you know, when we make a mistake, especially in applying the Bible truths, then at stake is your eternal life or eternal death. We really cannot make cannot afford to make a mistake. Don't study the Bible to justify the former belief that you have. Study the Bible with open minds. And the book of Revelation says, Blessed is he who read and hear and put that into practice. And let us study the Word of God. God's Word is a love letter. He loves you and me. And He wants you really to follow the instructions for your own good. And ultimately, that we will be restored from this world, the sinful world. And we will be in a world where no more sin and no more hatred and no more sorrow. And we will be living forever and ever throughout eternity. What a beautiful promise that God has given. And it is all the instructions are all in the Bible. So there's nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than to study the scriptures. And in fact, only Jesus Christ can save us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, when you look at what Jesus Christ said of the Old Testament scripture, as well as the New, the, according to John chapter 5, 39 says, they are they which testify of me. Read it and apply it in your life. May the Lord God bless us as we think of the beautiful reminders for us. All the reminders is telling us God loves you. For God to love the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him will not die. And it is recorded in the Bible. It is the whole Bible, the old and the new. God bless each one of us. Mm -hmm.